In today's show, two great examples of innovative European cars from the 1950s, an era when, in Britain at least, the country was still in the throes of rationing, and most of the cars looked like it and drove like it. Meanwhile, across the Channel, the French and Germans weren't suffering as much and were flexing their engineering muscles to come up with two gems like this. We glide around the hills in this wonderful Mercedes Ponton Cabrio, probably the first German car aimed at what became known as the Jet Set. And then later, we look at a rare British-built but French-designed Citroën. We even get a crash course on hydropneumatic suspension, Citroen style. And recline in the back of what must be one of the largest four-door saloons ever to come out of France. Alan Cross is the local organiser of the Mercedes-Benz Owners Club in the northwest of England, and so he knows a thing or two about the mark. One of his two immaculate Mercedes is featured today. The other we'll see in another show soon. The Mercedes Ponton sedan, launched in 1953, was one of the first completely new post-war designs from the Stuttgart-based manufacturer. Cabrios and coupés followed in 1956, and Alan's immaculate 220 SE dates from 1960. Longer, lower, and altogether more stylish than its rather dumpy four-door brother, the coupés and cabrios weren't sold in great numbers, many going to the US and not surviving. Thus, good examples now hold their value extremely well. I've had it for probably about six years now, I think. Uh, was taken by the style and the elegance of the car in the first instance, and I looked around for a few of them and to see what was available and did I sort of like the, the uh, condition of them and eventually we found one that was at the right price and that was six years ago. My car originally started out life in Germany and then it went to France and then to Portugal and finally it came to England via a, a dealer in London and I bought it off him. Since then the prices have gone up and up and up and it's been a very good investment really over the the six years that I've owned it. The engine size on this one is a 2.2 litre straight six cylinder. Uh, this particular one is powered by twin carburettors, twin Solex carbs on it, and they're quite reasonable once they're set up. Um, if you're going on a long run, there's something like 25, 26 miles to the gallon out of it, which is not too bad really. People say, what does it do to the gallon? Well. If you're running an old car like this, it doesn't really matter what it does to the gallon. You're not using it all day, every day, and so you put fuel in when you need it. It's uh, fairly easy to drive, although you've got to get used to no power steering, left-hand drive, column change. Once you've got the master of that, then it's all right, it's fine. The car itself drives quite sort of serenely really, it's a very easy ride, it's a very sort of soft suspension, a very floaty suspension. It's not like the modern cars where you've got uh, a very stiff suspension system which if you drive over a pound coin you know whether it's heads or tails, you know, on these you don't, you start to waft along a bit really and that was a style of motoring in the, the sort of late 50s and early 60s which these cars uh, were produced in. But it's a nice driving experience, it's just going back 50 years. I vaguely remember what it was like 50 years ago, <laughs> just. The car was called a Ponton because originally um, the German population that were looking at these cars as a saloon noticed that they had a whacking great front suspension between the two sort of uh, front wheels and it was very similar to a pontoon bridge and they, get, they christened it the ponton which in German I believe is pontoon. But notwithstanding its heavy weight, you could even say bridge-like underpinnings, the Mercedes Ponton Cabrio is an exceptionally pretty car. 
It's been styled with a light touch that masks its size, and so will have been at home, parked outside the swanky watering holes of Europe, as well as in its most important export market, the US. From certain angles, especially looking at the rear deck, there's a real flavour of the Italian stylists. Whilst the pronounced rump, with its distinctive swage line over the rear wheels, hints at the six-cylinder power beneath the bonnet. The saloons were the ones that they produced first of all and they produced those in the tens of thousands and they went all around the world and were used a lot of the time as taxis. Uh, eventually they came to design a coupe and a cabriolet based on the same chassis but with a, a modified body design and a much more elegant design. Whereas the Ponton saloon was quite rounded, these coupes and cabriolets were very long and elegant. They were slightly longer, they had a bit more chrome on them, they had the fancy wooden trim inside on the dashboard and round the door cappings and so on. Uh, and they were very elegant cars as, as a, a specialised model from the Ponton originally. And the people that they were aiming at were the sort of captains of industry and the American market with the film stars and the, the well-off gentry in America because a lot of them when they were produced went to the States. The dashboard's made out of one piece of wood really. It's a great big lump of a piece with a fancy shape of the grab handle for the front passenger. Um, it's quite a complicated shape. It's got all the instruments set in it, the main cluster. Uh, this one has been veneered in a, a burl walnut which makes it look very elegant and quite expensive looking. There's cappings on the doors, there's trim along the middle edges of the doors. They were very expensive cars and, and very luxurious. You had thick deep carpet in them, you had reclining seats in them. Uh, you didn't tend to have air conditioning in them in those days. They, they haven't sort of quite cottoned on to the air conditioning system. Many options were available for the Cabrio, aimed as it was at the luxury end of the market. Allen's Ponton sports this folding rear bench seat, laid flat for luggage, or upright for two full-sized passengers. Of the coupes and the cabriolets, I think the, the company made something like 3,200 between them and they ran from 1955 to 1960. The, the hand-built sort of models were built to a, a standard rather than a price level. They made the car and then worked out how much it was going to cost. Uh, and eventually it, it arrived at a price level which was approximately twice the price of a saloon. So they were very expensive, so they were a niche market that they were aiming for, which was uh, at the top end of the scale really. Mercedes of the periods tended to use either white steering wheels or black steering wheels and all the accessories were ivory coloured as well to match in with the steering wheel. They presumably at the time thought they looked quite elegant with the chrome finishing on the, the horn ring and the indicator ring on this one. This one has got a column steering column change, four gears, fairly reliable, fairly taut, but it's a total change from a floor column thing. In England there's probably only about 20 or 30 on the road. In the northwest of England, which I'm based in, uh, there's a colleague of mine's got one and we're the only two that we know of so if I see somebody coming towards me in one of these it's him. In England these particular cars are not that well known so the price levels tend to be a little bit lower than they are in Europe and especially in Germany. Over here they tend to sell for around about 60 or 70 or 80 thousand pounds which sounds quite a lot but until you compare it with the price levels in Germany and we go to the classic car shows over there and currently they're selling for anything from 100 to 120, even 130,000 euros. But because there's only just over 3,000 of them originally, and there's probably less than maybe 1,000 still around and about, they are quite rare cars and they do command a price. 
and if you have one it is worth restoring it and spending money on it because in today's sort of economic market it's really better than having money in the bank and accumulating interest because the price levels of these cars are tending to go up by five ten percent a year so if you've got one it's worth hanging on to it or spending money on it and letting it uh, appreciate in value and have the fun of driving it while you're owning it. Generally the cars are quite reliable. There are certain sort of units on the car such as the chrome trim for instance which is very expensive because it's no longer produced in any great quantities and what you do find is either second-hand ones or very expensive reproduction parts but on the other hand there are sort of running gear parts that are particularly cheap you know I had a, a wheel bearing go a few months ago and I think it was about 18 pounds for the wheel bearing but it's surprising what you can pay for sort of standard running gear stuff that replacement parts that are not overly expensive and it's things that you can do yourself you don't look at something and think oh that's awkward and difficult because you can recognize it and you can see it and if you've got a smattering of knowledge of of car maintenance you can actually do things yourselves on these cars you don't need a computer to work out what's wrong with it if there's something wrong it's got carburetors and plugs and distributors and they're very easy to sort out and deal with and you can recognize them. The older cars of this sort of vintage were very much dependent on grease points and suspension points with grease nipples all over the place and on the front suspension of this particular car there's probably about 20 odd grease points that you have to pump with grease at a fairly regular interval of they recommend every 3,000 miles or so but it's something that you can do yourself yeah, in the engine bay you can get at all the components fairly easily really and you can see where they are uh, and they're all accessible. The plug leads, the distributor, all the, the heater pipes, the water pipes, the carburetor, the air filters, all the connections for the brakes and so on. This particular car has a one-piece hood with a, a lining inside it so you don't see any of the straps or hoops for the hood mechanism. It just looks inside like it does in a, a saloon or a, a two-door coupe. So it's got a very luxurious feeling to it. And you don't feel as if you're in a, an open-top car. The Mercedes-Benz Car Club is one of the largest and most active single mark clubs in the UK. Members regularly attend shows all over the country. And at this recent event, Alan's Ponton Cabrio was one of the stars of the show. This particular car isn't a sort of trailer queen of any description. It actually drives to various locations. We go to car shows in this country and around the north of England. We've been to France two or three times. We go to Germany on various runs. Uh, and it goes and it gets there. If it conks out, we fix it. I think the driving experience of one of these cars is something quite unique really because it gives you a great deal of inner pleasure and satisfaction when you are driving one, something like this. And if you're driving down the road with the hood down and the windows open, you find you're having conversations with lorry drivers and taxi drivers and bus drivers who always want to know what car it is, how old it is, what's it's worth, do you want to sell it? I've had that one occasionally. So it's a very nice experience and you find kids and people watch you go past as you're driving past. And they do notice it, you do get noticed. You can't be a, a shrinking violet in one of these sort of cars when you're driving anywhere in it really. And you've always got to be prepared to have a conversation with somebody and know what are the cars about, otherwise they're very disappointed that you know now about it. Now to our second car today, a Citroen. Most people know the classic Maigret Citroën, the Traction Avant, meaning front-wheel drive in French. First launched in 1934, many versions and body styles were produced until it was discontinued in 1957, by which time over three quarters of a million had been built. 
The Citroën Traction Abons weren't the first front-wheel drive cars mass-produced, but were the first front-wheel drive cars to be built with monocoque construction. Unlike other cars of the period, this allowed the Traction Avant to be low. And with a wheel in each corner, front-wheel drive and unique torsion bar suspension, the car had excellent ride and handling. Today we meet the largest of the Traction Avant family, known as the 15CV in France, but in the UK as the Big Six, due to its 3-litre six-cylinder engine. Rare enough, but in 1954, Citroën had the bright idea of putting the hydro-pneumatic rear suspension from the soon-to-be-launched DS onto it, and the Big Six H was born. I saw this car came up for sale at Easter, and I thought, well, I've always fancied a Big Six, and a Big Six hydraulic is extremely rare. And I said to my wife, can I buy it? And she said, if you've got the money and you think it's a good car, then buy it. So I bought this car um, and as you can see I've done very very little on it so far apart from change the suspension spheres and changed all the rubbers. The rest of the car is as I bought it. The car was built in 1955 and has had prior to myself three owners. The first owner had it from 1955 until 1964 and he took the car off the road for renovation. The car sat in a lockup in Wallasey till 1990 when the person who owned it was getting quite elderly by this point and certainly past the point of being able to rebuild it. He sold this car which is the six hydraulic and the other car which was a standard big six together as a pair wouldn't split them, had to go as a pair. Steve Southgate bought both of these cars, of which he renovated this, and this was one of his favourite cars that he went everywhere in and used it for a lot of weddings. Uh, this car was then sold on in 2001, and I bought it at Easter 2013. So the first renovator renovated all the body, and the second renovator spent a vast amount of money on the engine and the gearbox and the transmission. It's my intention to tidy it up round the edges but leave the original leather seats, window surrounds and headlining as they are and, and just titivate the edges up. So it's a great car to drive, it drives really well, it's quiet, it's smooth and I'll be keeping it for a while. At launch these cars were seen as super stylish rakish even. By the time the model was replaced by the DS, people thought them old-fashioned, their pre-war lines too bulbous and curvy for the space age. Now though, 60 years on, we can appreciate the shape for what it is, authentic automotive art. Like the Model T a generation before, the Traction Avant set new standards in manufacturing, as well as in comfort, handling and road holding. Traction Avons were built in the main Citroën factory in Paris, as well as in Belgium, Denmark, Germany and the UK. There, the factory was in Slough, west of London, and in total over 25,000 right-hand drive Traction Avons were assembled there. The primary reason that Citroën came to Slough was that there was a tax applied to cars that were made outside of the country, and I believe it was of the order of 33%. So you can imagine that you've got a, quite a reasonably good trade bringing your cars in from France, doing small amounts of tailoring for the British market, including moving the steering wheel and the pedals over to the right hand side, and then a tax comes along. The way to get the, the Citroen got round this car tax was to have an agreement that they would open a factory in the UK and that the cars would have 51% British content. So such things as the wheels, um, the tyres, the carpets, the woodwork for the dashboards, the leather seats, the sunroofs which were never fitted to the French cars, uh, Lucas Electrics all round basically meant that they could actually have a car that avoided the import car tax. Once the cars were actually built in the UK, they were then actually exported to the colonies. 
So we had South Africa, a lot went to Australia, New Zealand, some of them have been known to end up in other African countries, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, the lot. So what you actually got was a, basically a, a French designed car with a, the panels produced in France, but all the interior work and all the electrics done in the UK. So you would not find a French car with a wooden dashboard. You certainly probably not find them with leather seats. Definitely not have a sunroof on them. And uh, 12 volt electrics. That's one thing that Lucas did was add the 12 volt electrics. This car is unique. One, because it was built in Slough and there wasn't many, many cars built in Slough. The other thing that makes this pretty well unique is the fact that it's a big six hydraulic. That is, they put the hydraulics on, on the back of this that they then went on to use in the DS19s. Although there was a, a reasonable number made in France, there was only two of this particular model made in 1954, and there was 75 made in 1955. This is believed to have been built on a Monday in November 1954, and was first registered on the 3rd of February 1955. This, is, this has been produced with the British market in mind, so you've got softly sprung leather seats, you've got deep pile carpets, you've got pockets in the, in the doors, you've got pocket for your map in the front, and a sunroof. So you've got a sunroof. As can be seen, this is one of the roomiest cars you could ever imagine. Um, there's a probably getting on for 18 to 20 inches of legroom, and it actually has a detachable footrest just so you can got somewhere to put your feet. Um, there's a big armrest in the middle, uh, and the suspension is very soft, and you can just fall asleep straight away in here. General visibility in the car out of the front and the side windows is very good. Um, like a lot of cars of its era, it has a very, very small back window. Although I do back the car, I do, I, I, uh, I prefer to actually have somebody at the back to uh, tell me where the corners are. You had front wheel drive, which although was no, not the first car to have front wheel drive, it was one of the first cars to be mass produced in, with front wheel drive. And along with the monocoque chassis and the torsion bar suspension made this a very good car to drive. It's worth emphasising just how advanced these cars were for their time. Instead of a separate chassis with a body sitting on top, Citroen designed an all-welded unibody or monocoque construction. But this method was untried for mass production. Although the engines themselves weren't remarkable, the fact that the cars were front-wheel drive and had the gearbox in front of the longitudinally mounted engine was. This layout also involved Citroen in the costly development of a unique drive chain. The unusual items we've actually got in here, though, are the additions of a high-pressure hydraulic pump here, the reservoir there which has the, the hydraulic fluid in it, and an accumulator and then the accumulator is connected to a self-leveling valve where the back axle would be, which actually pumps up the suspension. Now, in order to provide damping, they actually used a set of spheres which actually sit on the back of the hydraulic rams. And in the front part of here, you've got the pressure from the hydraulics, which is at the same pressure as the hydraulic ram. And in the centre of here, you have a diaphragm and in the back, you have inert gas at, um, I think it's something like 350 psi. So that when you actually go over a bump, it compresses the gas, which absorbs the shock, and then rebounds. So consequently, it's like having a standard shock absorber, but it's all gas-based, and it's very, very soft. So what you can actually do, because it's acting against the, the pressure in the spheres, is this is the damping effect. And you can see that you can actually quite happily pick the car up and down and it comes to rest. That's not done with any springing, it's done with the hydraulics and the pressure of the gas in the spheres. So when you go down the road it glides on a cushion of gas and torsion bars at the front. 
So you've got all round independent suspension on a car which was designed in the early 30s. This control in the back here controls the height. So at the moment it's at normal position. If I move it down to the bottom, the whole system goes down. If I move it back to the middle, And then there's the position that you use when changing the wheel, which is right at the very top. And as you can see, the car goes up a very long way at that point. And then to change the wheel, rather than actually putting a jack under it, they actually provide a triangular stand. And this triangular stand then clips into there. and then you let the car back down again. Onto the stand. Stephen, as you see, has more than one traction Avo. In fact, he's got three. It's interesting to see the size difference between these two. The white car is his slough built Light 15, which he's completely restored over the last few years treating it to a bare metal restoration and a full mechanical rebuild. Anyway, back to the big six. When I bought the car, there was a complete portfolio from the 1950s right up to present day. Fuel consumption and the purchase of petrol for 1959 all the way up to 1964. So we have entries in here, and I think there was one uh, 38,869 and he put 10 gallons in and it was two pound two and sixpence. In addition to the little red notebook, I also had his maintenance book where he wrote down all the jobs that he needed to do. So he carboned everything that he ever sent off. Uh, as this is probably the only 1954 car that is in existence, it is unique. Um, there was two made in 54 and 75 made in 55 and then they were discontinued. It's one thing to actually buy a car, but you should buy a car that you can actually use. Even if it's only on special occasions like a Sunday best car. But cars are there for being driven, they're not there to actually sit as museum pieces. A car that's not driven uh, deteriorates. Better to actually buy a car, love and cherish it, and take it out when you can.